going to get the preliminaries out of the way before the introduction. Uh, my name is Ben Rich, and on behalf of the Bioethics Program of the UC Health System, I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of the fourth year of the Distinguished Bioethics Lecture Series at UC Davis. Those of you who do any flying at all are familiar with the refrain that you hear after touchdown, which is, we know you have a choice of airlines. Well, we know you have a choice of activities at this hour of the day. And your choice was particularly rich and diverse tonight. You could have joined the folks in our nation's capital as the president addresses a joint session of Congress, a place where it seems, uh, to quote Banquo in Macbeth, all seem to have eaten of the insane root that takes reason hostage. <laughs> <laughs> then you could perhaps go to NBC, and you, if you haven't seen enough open hostility already, you could watch the kickoff of the opening game of the NFL season with the, I believe, the New Orleans Saints playing the Green Bay Packers. Or you could channel surf, and you could go to ABC and watch a program called White Belt, <laughs> which is actually not a documentary about our current economic circumstances, <laughs> nor about uh, the history of surfing in Southern California. Or you could go to CBS, and you could watch a program called Big Bang Theory. Now, my suspicion, but it's only a suspicion, is that this does not involve Professor Stephen Hawking, the astrophysicist, or perhaps a return from the hereafter by the late great Carl Sagan. What it does involve, I will, I will leave to your own inquiry, because I'm someone whose viewing is limited to PBS public service program. I think you've chosen well by coming here tonight, and let me tell you why. Just a few academic preliminaries. We are, after all, an academic medical center. So uh, Dr. True received his BS, summa cum laude, majoring in biochemistry at UCLA. He also received his MD from UCLA and was at the, uh, entered into Alpha Omega Alpha Honorary Fraternity. He did his pediatric internship and residency at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center, his anesthesiology residency back at UCLA, along with an anesthesiology and critical care fellowship. Along the way, he got a master's in philosophy at Brown University, being mentored by one of the preeminent figures in American bioethics Dan Rock. Currently, he has professorial appointments at Harvard University in pediatric anesthesia, medical ethics, and he's also, as that indicates there, senior associate in critical care medicine at the Boston Children's Hospital. He's director of the Institute for Professionalism and Ethics at Harvard and jointly with Boston Children's Hospital. He has published over 200 articles in bioethics and professional journals. And, and I know that you've probably all taken kind of New Year's resolution pledge to ratchet down the volume of bioethics articles that you read. So if you read only one bioethics article this year, the one I commend to you was written by Bob and his colleague Dan Brock and another collaborator of his at the NIH, Franklin Miller, under the title of Moral Fictions and Medical Ethics, published in the journal called simply Bioethics in 2010. If you can't find it and you want some help, send me an email and I will get you a copy of it. It will challenge your most basic assumptions, if not your core beliefs. And to his great credit, and one of the reasons I'm so glad he's here, is he does not shy away from what our friends across the Atlantic call controversy. 
And just to give you some further confirmation of that, he co-authored with his colleague, Franklin Miller, an article in a journal called Chest, which is the official journal of the American College of Chest Physicians, with the provocative title that poses two questions. Are donors after circulatory death really dead? And does it matter? And the answer, also in the title, is no and not really. Here's what they said in this article, which I think is part of a, an important introduction to him. With regard to maintaining the trust of the public, to date the assumption has been that the public is not capable of engaging in a discussion about the ethical complexities of organ transplantation and needs to be reassured that the current practices accord with traditional ethical principles. Now, Dr. Trude's presence tonight is living proof and of affirmation that you are capable of engaging in the challenge of a full-fledged discussion in all of its ethical complexity. And the beauty of having that discussion orchestrated by Dr. Trug is that he is someone who brilliantly combines both the clinical and the ethical bona fides. So without any further delay, please welcome to UC Davis, Dr. Robert Trug. May truly be the kindest introduction I've ever had, and I, uh, I do appreciate that. I got to know Ben Rich and Mark Yarborough out in, in Colorado many years ago, and it's wonderful to follow them both here to UC Davis. As you probably uh, got the message, what I am going to talk about tonight is controversial, um, and uh, I'm going to keep my comments as, as brief as I can to allow as much time for us to discuss them afterwards, and I welcome the, the opportunity to, uh, to debate this back and forth and, and do it in a way that, uh, you know, hopefully we won't follow the uh, sort of standard set of the Republican debate the other night. I think we can, you know, do this in a, in a way that uh, is much more um, both friendly but also exploratory and productive. So um, to move us along, um, I wanted to give a little bit of a background primer, if you will, for uh, how organ donation is done and the ethical standards that we use. So um, you need to know that there are two pathways for organ donation, the brain death pathway and the donation after cardiac death, or DCD pathway. And both of them begin with the question, is the patient dead? And this relates to kind of a, a fundamental ethical assumption that goes throughout the history of organ transplantation that people must be declared dead before we remove a vital organ like their heart or their lungs or their liver. It's not actually a law anywhere, it's not written down anywhere, but it's this fundamental ethical assumption that has guided the ethics of organ transplantation. And so if you're on the brain death pathway over there, the patient is declared dead on the basis of the irreversible loss of all brain function, and then organs are removed um, while the heart is still beating, or under a condition where the organs are in optimal condition. They're, they're getting oxygen and being perfused with blood right up until uh, the time that they're removed. The other pathway, the DCD pathway, death is declared on the basis of the irreversible loss of circulatory function, heart function, and then the organs are removed after the heart has stopped. And using this approach, once the heart is stopped, a stopwatch is initiated, and depending on the protocol, after either any period of time from 75 seconds to two minutes to five minutes, at that point, the patient is declared dead and the organs are removed for transplantation. So I'm gonna go through these in a little bit more detail and explore them with you, but I wanted to kind of lay that out. And these two pathways uh, are based upon the law that we have in this country that was developed in the early 1980s, the Uniform Determination of Death Act, 
uh, which says that an individual who has sustained either irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem, is dead. And with minor variation, this is the law that we have now in all 50 states. And so you can see the first one there is the way that death is declared to support DCD donation, and the second one is the way that we declare death to support brain death donation. So let me, let me look at both of these pathways um, and ask the question, are the donors dead? So let's start with the brain death pathway. Are the donors dead? And I'm going to give you three possible ways that we might look at it. So to go back to the law, the law requires that we diagnose brain death when the patient has the irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. Now, it's honestly not controversial. We know that few patients actually meet this standard. Most patients that we diagnose as brain dead do continue to have some or a variety of brain functions. They typically are functions that we are not looking at and we don't think are important. But many of them are actually fu functions that are pretty central to the brain, regulating uh, salt and water balance through pituitary function, the way that the brain responds to pain, temperature regulation, these sorts of things are pretty core functions. So right off the bat, we've got a problem here in that we're di diagnosing brain death by a law which requires that all functions be gone, and yet we all agree that in many, indeed most of these patients, they have not truly lost all function. And this was recognized um, very early on uh, by a prominent neurologist, uh, James Burnett, who's at Dartmouth, and he said, okay, well, we, we have a problem here with the definition of brain death. We've got to come up with something else. So he did, said that brain dead patients are dead not because they've lost all of their functions, that's not true, but because they have, quote, the permanent cessation of functioning of the organism as a whole. The idea that he was developing is that, you know, the brain is kind of the command central for the body. And when the brain is severely damaged, uh, you lose the command central, and the body sort of, fall, sort of falls apart. It disintegrates. And in developing this, he was drawing on uh, evidence from the 1970s that showed that when patients are brain dead, no matter how hard you try to keep them alive, they will have a cardiac arrest within no more than seven days. Without the brain, the body just can't keep going. And so this argument was very influential through the 1980s and the 1990s. The problem is, is that today we know it to be scientifically false, largely through the work of a neurologist, Alan Schumann, at UCLA. We now know that although brain-dead patients, patients diagnosed as brain-dead, have an initial instability, um, if you get them through that first period, they can actually live for many years. And in fact, Alan Schumann has meticulously shown that there are patients diagnosed as brain-dead who have lived for more than 14 years. So as much as we like this argument from Bernat, it's just not true anymore. It's scientifically not true anymore. The third thing that resonates with a lot of people is perhaps brain dead patients are really dead because they have permanently lost the capacity for consciousness. And this is in fact true. There's never been a case where somebody we've diagnosed as brain dead has ever regained consciousness. And so people will say, well, maybe that's what we should mean by a definition of death. You've permanently lost consciousness. The problem with that is that if we define death as the permanent loss of consciousness, then patients who are in a persistent vegetative state would also be dead. So the Terry Schiavos of the world, I mean, you know all the controversy we had around that. Can you imagine if we would have said, oh, we don't have to worry about whether we're, we're going to withdraw life support or tube fittings on her because under the law she's already dead, even though she's breathing, even though she's you know, living in a nursing home with a feeding tube. You can imagine that would be a very difficult sell in our society. It would really force us to engage the question, would burial or cremation of PBS patients, again, thousands of them living in nursing homes, breathing on their own, being tube fed, would burial or cremation of these patients be socially acceptable? Uh, I think not, and if not, then death must be defined as more than just the permanent loss of consciousness. 
Now this is a pretty quick tour through uh, a lot of material, but let me just say that my conclusion is that there is no coherent scientific, philosophical, or theological rationale for considering brain-dead patients to be dead. Um, and it's controversial, but I'd be interested in talking about it, because I just don't really think there is any way to refute those arguments. Uh, instead, I think that brain death does serve a very socially important person, but important purpose for us, because it allows us to diagnose patients as dead so that we can remove organs for transplantation and appear to be following the dead donor rule. Indeed, this diagnosis exists almost exclusively to serve purposes of organ donation. Again, there, as I said in the slide, to, to uh, treat patients in some ways as being as good as dead for purposes of organ donation, even if they don't meet any sort of a biological understanding of death. Now, for people like me that have to take board exams every once in a while to stay certified, and neurologists and neurosurgeons, if, if you come across a question on the test that says, are brain dead patients dead? You know, I can promise you, you better answer it yes, or it's going to be marked wrong. This is, this is the dogma that we learn in medical school. This is the dogma that is taught and promulgated throughout all of the medical system. And yet, when you sit down with doctors and nurses who actually take care of patients who have been diagnosed as brain dead, you actually find out that they have a view much more similar to mine than to the dogma even if they're not fully conscious of it. And I want to give you an example of it. Um, you know, an example of one isn't proof of anything, but I think it's suggestive. And it has to do with uh, this case here that occurred a few years ago, Susan Torres. She was a 26-year-old pregnant woman who unfortunately had a hemorrhage into a brain tumor that had not yet been diagnosed. And as a result of this was declared brain dead. She was maintained on quote-unquote life support because she was already dead in the legal sense. Um, and then several months later delivered a uh, premature little baby at 27 weeks gestation. Now, um, this was big in the news, and it was on Larry King Live, and I want to show you a little clip from Larry King Live. And to do that, I've got to get out of my presentation here, and hopefully this will all work. <coughs> Sanjay Gupta, I think, is a wonderful reporter. In fact, um, what I think this shows us is the fact that um, many of us who work in intensive care units 
um, actually have somewhat conflicting views about what brain death really means. Sanjay Gupta is a neurosurgeon. I'm sure he's diagnosed brain death uh, many, many times. Um, and yet, in this interview, he gets it completely wrong in terms of what our standard teaching is. Is a brain dead person dead? He says, well, a dead person really means that the heart is no longer beating. No, that's, that's not what we're trained. Uh, brain death means no chance of recovering. We aren't requiring artificial support to be alive. Well, no, they're actually dead. Uh, we do draw a distinction between brain dead and dead, but we're repeatedly told not to draw that distinction. Uh, now, Larry King, uh, he's a smart guy, so he says, oh, well, then if you're telling me she's alive, then obviously you wouldn't transplant an organ from her. And, you know, now Dr. Gooch is trying to somehow recover here. And, well, actually, you could. He says, well, you know, not because she's dead, but because her brain's not going to recover. So he provides a, a, a large rationale around why it should be okay to both tr transplant organs from her, but he is basically saying, no, I don't really think that the reason it's okay is because she's dead, because I'm not really saying that she is dead. Um, so, you know, and in fact, there's other, there's other work that's shown that many people who work with these patients feel the same way. So let's move on now to uh, donation after cardiac death pathway. And here we're going to decide that patients are dead on the basis of the irreversible loss of circulatory function and the organs are going to re be removed 75 seconds to 5 minutes after cardiac arrest. And just to give you a little bit more of a flavor of what this looks like. So in an intensive care unit, uh, we'll have a patient with either very severe lung disease or severe neurologic disease, but they're not brain dead. Nevertheless, in working with the family, a decision is made to withdraw the ventilator and allow them to die. Now, if the expectation is that this patient will not be able to survive for more than 60 minutes, after life support is withdrawn, they are potentially a candidate for DCD donation. And then life support is withdrawn at my hospital in the operating room and other hospitals in the intensive care unit, and you wait. And you wait for them to stop breathing, and you wait for them to have a cardiac arrest. And it has to occur within 60 minutes. Why? Because the thought is, is that if the patient has a lingering death that goes on for more than an hour, the organs will be irretrievably damaged by this long lingering death. So it has to be a death that happens fairly rapidly, and the cutoff we currently use is about 60 minutes. And at that time, again, the stopwatch is started, we wait a period of time, 75 seconds to five minutes, and the organs are then removed. The patient is declared dead at the end of that waiting time. Now, uh, the case, one of the most famous uh, uh, reports about DCD is this one from the New England Journal of Medicine. This was actually done at a time when uh, Mark Yarbrough was uh, head of the ethics committee there, and he can probably tell us stories about this that go beyond the article. But um, just to uh, give you the, the picture here, um, this was a situation where there were three newborns who had severe birth asphyxia, severe brain damage from birth. Their parents had already decided that the ventilator was going to be withdrawn. They were going to allow these children to die. There were three other newborns with congenital heart disease whose only chance of survival was a heart transplant. And because they wanted to transplant the heart, they wanted to have a very short interval between the heart stopping and declaring death. And so they decided to pick 75 seconds. And I'll say more about that in a moment, but a pretty short period of time. And these were all successful, and they reported uh, three survivors. Okay, so you can tell the next question is, are DCD donors dead? And uh, let, me, let me look at that. So the, the law in America, the, U, the Uniform Determination of Death Act, requires that in order to declare somebody dead on the basis of cardiac function, you have to show that circulatory and respiratory functions have irreversibly ceased. Well, so for DCD donation, we can ask, is the loss of cardiac function irreversible? I mean, to me, there seems to be a pretty important logical problem here. If a heart is procured from a donor on the basis of the irreversible loss of its function, and then is transplanted and functions in the chest of another patient, how could the loss of function have been irreversible? I, the, the logic of it seems to be a problem for me. Um, now, 
This has been recognized and it's been addressed in the following way. Some argue, okay, some argue that by irreversible, we don't really mean that you could not reverse the, the loss of function, just that we have chosen not to reverse it. So they're saying in situations where we've made a decision that we're not going to resuscitate the patient, that we only have to wait long enough until the heart would not be able to start again on its own. That's a phenomenon called auto-resuscitation. And there's some data out there that says that hearts won't start on their own after 75 seconds. And so that's where the Denver group came up with the 75 second interval. Everybody agrees that after 75 seconds, many if not most patients could be resuscitated if you tried. But if you agree that you're not going to try, the heart won't start on its own. And so the argument goes that that's why we can say it was irreversible. Well, so far so good, but I think there's some problems with thinking this way. Let me give you um, a little thought experiment. I think there are problems with this choose not to reverse interpretation of irreversibility. So consider a young athlete who suffers a massive brain injury in a motor vehicle accident. He's in the ICU, his family decides to withdraw life support given his severe brain injury, and the family agrees to DCD donation. Life support is withdrawn and his heart has stopped for two minutes. Is he dead? Well, under current DCD policies, yes, he would be dead. You would declare him dead, and you would remove his organs for transplantation. Now imagine a similar young athlete who suffers a cardiac arrest while playing basketball. No one initiates CPR. EMS is called and arrives two minutes later. Is he dead? Well, I think it would be horrifying if, you know, as the paramedics come up and they're ready to start CPR, somebody says, oh, no, 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 got to understand, after two minutes it's okay to declare somebody dead and they don't resuscitate him when he would very likely be resuscitatable. So I think, you know, a problem with this way of structuring it is that dead should be dead. It doesn't matter if you're on the basketball court or if you're in the operating room at the hospital. These two patients, in similar situations, have both been asystolic for two minutes. How is it that we would say that one of them is dead, but the other is not? Or to make the same point in a little bit more dramatic way, consider the Denver scenario. So you've got um, this baby with severe, severe brain damage. They decided to withdraw life support. Uh, what they probably did was they brought the mother and the baby into the operating room. They took the baby off of the ventilator in the operating room, and they waited for cardiac arrest to occur and then they waited the additional 75 seconds. Now imagine at that 75 seconds and they tell the mother, you know, sorry to say, but your baby is now dead and we are going to go ahead and remove the heart. Just imagine if the mother said, I can't take this, I'm too emotionally distraught, not only don't, don't I want you to transplant, I'd like you to try to resuscitate my baby. And let's say that they do, maybe they shouldn't, but let's say that they do and let's say that they're successful. Um, what other interpretation can we have but that this baby came back from being dead? Was declared dead, now is successfully resuscitated, and is alive. Again, I think that this way of looking at it is just too contorted. It just has too many holes in what we mean reasonably when we want to say that somebody has died. So what does this mean? Well, it means that either my analysis of both brain death and DCD are wrong, which I'm perfectly willing to debate with you, um, I do believe it's correct, but um, I, I could well be wrong. Or, the only conclusion we can come to is that we routinely remove organs from patients who are not dead, and in doing so, we cause their death. In other words, we are violating the dead donor rule. We have this paradox in that we need living organs from patients who are dead, who have been at least declared dead, and I believe that we have contrived implausible definitions of death so that we can obtain living organs without appearing to violate the dead donor rule. Okay, so the last part here. Um, does it really matter whether the donors are dead? Is the dead donor rule really what we ought to be hanging our hat on? And um, for this, we're really going to have to go back to square one. We're going to have to go back to really the foundations of what we think is going on with the ethics of organ donation. And let's go back to the Denver case and consider the ethical vectors that are here. 
three children who are certain to die from devastating brain injury, parents who are highly motivated to donate, who may benefit psychologically from the chance to donate, three children who are certain to die if the transplant is not available. It really seems to me like the ethical vectors are all kind of lining up in favor of this being an acceptable thing to do, if not a very, very good thing to do. And one could even ask, why wait the 75 seconds? I mean, if, if the idea here is that we want this heart to maximally function after transplant, why are we giving it 75 seconds without oxygen and without blood flow? Why not just do the transplant immediately? Here's one of the recipients of those hearts. Pretty good looking little kid at 21 months of age. And so the question is then, once a patient has a lethal brain injury and a request to donate, what is gained ethically by putting that person through an orchestrated death in order to get to organ donation, which compromises the number and the quality of the organs. For most DCD donors, it's only going to be kidneys that you can obtain because going that period of time ruins the other organs. Why not, following the blue arrow at the bottom, don't we move directly to organ donation? What does that orchestrated death do for us ethically? And of course, the answer to that is really pretty obvious. The answer to that is one of the important commandments, if not the first commandment of medical ethics, is that doctors must not kill. And so if we take those organs out before these patients are declared dead, we are killing them for their organs. And that just seems like prima facie wrong, end of discussion, no more to say. But I'm going to try to say more about it. And I'm going to, I want to look here um, at this question of doctors killing and causing death and whether and what it means to say that doctors must not kill. I want to ask the question, do doctors cause death? And I'm going to ask you to raise your hands here in a moment. I want you to imagine removing a ventilator from a patient in a permanent vegetative state in accord with the patient's advanced directive and at the, fa and at the family's request. That's the case. And I want to ask you to ask yourself, and then I want you to answer for me, would it be an ethical thing to do? So how many would say, if faced with this situation, it would be ethical to withdraw this ventilator? Okay. And how many would say no? It would not be. And how many would be unsure? If you would be unsure. Okay. So most would say it's the ethical thing to do. And I would, I would state it a little bit more strongly in terms of the development of American law and ethics. It would not only be ethically acceptable, it would probably be a requirement that faced with a the family's right to refuse unwanted medical treatment that, uh, you, as a physician, you would be required to withdraw the ventilator under these circumstances. So now I would say, ask yourself, in doing so, would I be causing the patient's death? And how many feel that in removing that ventilator, they would be causing the patient's death? It depends. Depends. Depends on how you define death. Well, now the patient's going to die, right, when the ventilator is removed. Whether or not the ventilator depends on how you define death. Oh, what are you thinking? They're already dead because they're in a persistent vegetative well, state. Maybe they won't die if the ventilator is removed for two or three or four hours. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's okay. For the sake of the argument here, we'll come back. I mean, this is these are fair questions, totally fair questions. Let's say that this is a situation where the patient's on very high ventilator settings, and it looks like they're not going to survive for very long afterwards. And let's say you do it and they do die within a, a minute or two. Do you walk away feel it with the feeling that you have caused the patient's death? And many of you are going to say no. How many would say no, you did not cause the patient's death? Okay, and how many of you are unsure? I'd say you allowed it. You, didn't you allowed it to happen, right? And that's the language that we use. We allow the patient to die. Um, and that is, uh, I use that language all the time. So I want to take a critical look at that language, okay? Uh, we don't like to think that we cause the patient's death. But um, this patient could have survived months or even years if the patient had stayed on the ventilator, but for your action to remove the ventilator. And this so-called but-for test is a general legal standard of causation and fits with common sense understanding of causation. So, um, but for the fact that I turned the key in the ignition, the car would have kept running, right? Turning the key in the ignition to the off, off spot 
causes the car to stop running. But for the fact that I pushed the light switch, the light would have stayed on. My pushing the switch caused the light to go off. This is how we think about you know, most things in life. We don't like to think about it in the context of withdrawing ventilators, but I'm asking you why. Now, part of it comes from the very inflammatory nature of the statement, doctors must not kill. Remember that the word kill just means to cause death. But the way that we often use it in, in language implies a wrongness to it that is really not part of the meaning of the word. And you know, to give you other examples of where we use kill, we talk about killing in self-defense, it's not necessarily ethically wrong. In fact, it's often ethically right to kill in self-defense. Killing animals for food, debate about that, but most of us would say that there's not something ethically wrong with that. We do eat meat. And then, you know, killing bacteria with antibiotics. Come on, I mean, that's an ethically good thing to do most of the time that we do it. So wrongness is not a part of the word kill per se. And I would say be more accurate to, to say, instead of doctors must not kill, that doctors must not wrongfully cause death. But I do think it is inescapable that doctors do cause death. We don't like to think about that, but in my view, the view I'm presenting here is I think that we do. When we withdraw ventilators, when we withdraw dialysis at the end of life, when we take patients off of uh, you know, heart meds and things like that. So my point here, and this is very controversial, I know, and I, 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 at times I feel that sometimes people are offended by it, and I, I hope you aren't. I'm, I'm offering it in a, in a way of, of discussion here. Um, but I do think that doctors often do engage in death-causing acts, and that the majority of ICU deaths now follow the planned removal of a ventilator. I think that we cause the patient's death when we do that. Whether these death-causing acts are, are right or wrong uh, depends on a number of factors. Obviously, the patient's condition and prognosis. It's not okay to withdraw the ventilator if the patient's expected to recover. The socially sanctioned role of physicians to engage in death-causing acts. This is truly a privilege that's given by society to remove ventilators. You know, it's not okay for somebody to come in off the street and start making these decisions. Most importantly, most importantly, the consent of the patient or the patient's surrogate. It's never okay to do this unless you have that consent. And so, with this as kind of a controversial foundation to build on, let me kind of uh, wrap this up by asking you to rethink the ethics of vital, donate, vital organ donation, really from the foundation. And a different approach that uh, primarily Franklin Miller, um, who's a philosopher at the NIH and I have worked on, is consider patients who are dependent upon life support, have refused continuation of life support, and have consented to organ donation. If it is ethical for doctors to cause their death by removing life support, then is it ethical for doctors to cause their death by removing their vital organs? Kind of a radical thought, but is there a difference between their, those two? And if there is, what is it? I thought, I thought it was it. I'll get to it. Sorry, I'll, I'll get to the discussion after. But um, keep that in, keep keep holding that thought. Um, one thing I came across that uh, struck me as interesting: um, Henry Beecher is uh, uh, one of the fathers of, of bioethics. He was an anesthesiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital. He was actually the person who came up with the original definition of brain death. Uh, but in some of his writings right after that, he wrote, once the decision is made to turn off the respirator, as in this case that we're talking about, what difference does it make whether the heart is stopped by inexorable asphyxia or by removal? So he's asking, you know, this very question. Is there a difference between these two things? And back here in 1969, Henry Beecher is saying, hmm, I'm not sure that there is. So a different approach to organ donation uh, would be the one I've described. Now, I want to say that under this view, organ procurement from brain-dead donors would be ethical, uh, just as, it, as we currently regard it as now, but not because the donors are dead. I've tried to argue that the donors are not really dead, but rather it's ethical because they have consented to ventilator withdrawal and organ donation. And similarly, uh, organ procurement from DCD donors is ethical. Again, not because they're dead. I don't believe that they are but again because they have consented to ventilated withdrawal and organ donation. And the other thing is 
that in this case it is not necessary to wait for cardiac arrest, which limits both the number and the quality of the transplantable organs. Indeed, you know, as I said, under our current protocols, limited pretty much to kidneys, but under this approach it would be open to all organs and they would uh, be procured under the most ideal conditions. And so coming back here, it would you know, ask this question again. Is this orchestrated death on the pathway to organ donation really something that is ethically necessary? Um, just to give you maybe the starkest case where this would apply, consider a competent, ventilator-dependent, quadriplegic patient who requests ventilator withdrawal and who wants to be an organ donor. So this is somebody who is fully conscious on the ventilator, is able to talk to you, uh, for those of you who have dealt with situations like this, they're, they're heart-wrenching, you know? Somebody who says, um, I don't want to live like this anymore. I want you to stop my ventilator, and I want to die. And um, they're, they're not that uncommon, and they're, but they're, they're, they're tough. But we do respect patients' rights to refuse ventilation under these circumstances. And now this person is saying, I want to be an organ donor. I'd like, you know, I don't want to live anymore, but I would like to help other people. Well, in, under our current approach, the only option for this person would be DCD donation. We would sedate the patient to make them comfortable. We would discontinue ventilation. We would wait for cardiac arrest to occur. We would then wait some period of time, two to five minutes, and only the kidneys would likely be transplantable. A different approach, one that's not currently acceptable, but what I'm suggesting to you would be to give this patient an anesthetic, recover the heart, lungs, kidneys, liver, pancreas, intestine, whatever, and then remove life support and declare him dead. This, well, so to summarize, um, under the approach that I've described to you, I want to emphasize that no patient would die who would not otherwise die. That these are patients who are dependent on life support and have chosen to have it with God. <coughs> the wishes of patients to be organ donors could be honored more fully in the sense that they would be more capable of, of donating more and of higher quality donations. More lives would be saved by organ donation. And a little side benefit, in my view, would be that the ethics of organ donation would not rest upon untenable definitions of death. And so the very last little bullet here would be where do we go from here? And this is more recent work that comes from Seema Shaw, who is a lawyer and philosopher at the NIH, and Frank Miller, again, at the NIH. And this is work that we've written about this year, and in a book that Frank and I have coming out this year. Where do we go from here? Um, if this critique is correct, then our current practices violate the dead donor rule. Yet organ donation and transplantation are life-saving and ethical practices. So, you know, in my mind, we're kind of in a box. Um, it's not like I'm saying, su you know, suggesting that we have to rethink this. If you believe the critique about brain death and donation after cardiac death, we are already violating the dead donor. So we either have to say, that's okay, and there's another rationale, or we would need to stop what we're currently doing. Stopping what we're currently doing wouldn't make any sense. These are life-saving practices. Uh, and yet many in the transplantation community say that reconsidering the dead donor rule would destroy organ donation in this country. So I think our options are to continue to muddle for forward um, and sort of just ignore what I've had to say in this talk, right? Uh, I mean, people are getting organ transplants tonight. The whole process is working. Lives are being saved. You know, we don't really need to look at this too closely. And I think this is by far the dominant view in medicine. Uh, my personal view is that in the long run, conceptual clarity and honesty eventually triumphs and leads to better decisions overall. How, so we could radically change our approach to organ donation immediately. I'm enough of a realist to know that this is not going to happen. So is there an approach that moves us incrementally towards a more honest position? And um, I'd like to suggest an idea to you. Again, this came from lawyers, uh, but I thought it was kind of, kind of interesting. And it's this concept called legal fictions that exists in the law. And it's used in the law when the law recognizes that A is not the same as B, but they are sufficiently similar that for certain legal purposes, A can be treated as if it is the same as B. And I think that there's ways that legal fictions could allow to acknowledge that neither brain-dead donors nor DCD donors are medically dead, 
but could consider them to be dead for purposes of organ donation, that is, legally dead. And let me sketch it out for you very briefly. It's, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, there's an idea in the law called status fictions, where A and B are clearly different, but similar in some ways. And the best example of that is that corporations are, for legal, persons, for legal purposes, often treated as persons. And an advantage is that you can use one law to cover two similar situations. And so uh, corporations are considered as persons, for example, in determining the legal jurisdictions for lawsuits. Now, you can take this too far. Um, and so you've got to be careful how you use it. But obviously, if we were to say, well, we're going to allow corporations to vote, that would be taking it too far. But the idea is that maybe this would be a way for brain death to be seen as a status fiction. In other words, brain dead patients aren't really dead, but we can consider them as dead for purposes of transplantation. So that's how we could cover the, um, the uh, brain death situation. And then another kind of uh, fiction could cover the DCD situation, and that's the idea of anticipatory fictions in the law. And um, in the law, this pertains when A will imminently become B. And the example that we use here is an anticipatory breach of contract. That is, when it is certain that a contract will be breached, the law may treat it as if it were already breached in order to prevent the harm that would follow from allowing the breach to actually occur. And we think that DCD could be framed in the same way as an anticipatory fiction. In other words, they're not currently dead, but they are imminently about to become dead, and so it's okay for us to treat them now as if they were already dead in order to allow organ, organ procurement to occur before the onset of harmful ischemia. So these are just a couple of ideas of how lawyers have try to take the ideas that I've talked about in terms of what do we do about this problem and maybe come up with an approach that works. So the perceived need, let me just say how I'm going to sum this up here. The perceived need to adhere to the dead donor rule is distorting both definitions of death and approaches to current practice. I think a shift in our perspective will take years, but in the meanwhile, a legal fictions approach can reduce the discrepancy between scientific facts and clinical practice while causing minimal disruption in the transplantation enterprise. So let me just summarize what I've tried to say this evening. I would have laid the argument that neither brain dead uh, donors nor DCD donors are dead by any medical or logical criteria. Yet I'm saying that organ donation from both may be ethical. Since these patients are dependent on life support, they have refused life support and they have requested organ donation. However, even if it is ethical, this approach would violate the dead donor rule, which has been sacrosanct in our way of thinking about these ethics. And so I presented to you a different approach, which argues that doctors may ethically cause death in some cases. And in fact, I've tried to convince you, perhaps with more or less success, that we already routinely do cause death in the practice of medicine. And I've argued that causing death by removal of vital organs may be ethically acceptable, just as it is often ethical to cause death by removing a ventilator. And I've tried to argue that with an incremental approach based on the concept of legal fictions, we may be able to move forward without radical changes in our societal view of these ethical standards. So with that, um, again, I uh, welcome debate. I, I hope none of you brought your AK-47s, but I. Uh, I'm prepared for almost anything that, uh, that you'd like to share. Truly, I mean, I realize that these were controversial issues, and, uh, and I, I offered them respectfully, and I, I hope you'll share your honest views as well. So, thank you. Uh, yes? Do we do a microphone, uh, Ben, or do people just speak up? Yeah, I'll First of all, um, I don't envy you. <laughs> I would hate to make that decision myself, even though I have some strong feelings toward what you presented. But I'd like to get practical about it. It seems to me that what you talked about was somebody lying in a hospital bed, and uh, the, all of the equipment there, all of the tanks were there, all of the facilities were there, and the decisions to be made. But what about the guy like me that in my pocket, on my uh, driver's license, I have a little red dot, I believe that's right, and a little note in there, 
if anybody wants an 89-year-old anything I've got, they can have it. <laughs> there are some things that I don't think they'd even consider. But, uh, so from a practical viewpoint, I'm in an automobile wreck, and I'm declared dead out there by paramedics or somebody. What are the chances of any of my organs being used at all, or does anybody give a damn? Well, if you are declared dead in outside of the hospital, for all intents and purposes, none of your vital organs are going to be able to be transported. And it's not just because you're 89. That would be true for anybody else. Now, I mean, it is possible to do tissue transplantation, heart valves, corneas, skin bone, that sort of thing. But by the time you would be in a situation where uh, medicine could procure your organs, they would already have suffered too long without oxygen and blood flow to be useful. So that's why the situation I've described are highly controlled in a hospital setting. Okay. You mentioned towards the end that the, uh, the idea is unrealistic to you that the concept you've presented would be adopted with any speed. And what are the resistance points? I mean, one can logic that one resistance point are physicians who mm -hmm. are used to it. The second are those on whom this procedure would be uh, carried out that may have another interpretation or belief based on what already has happened. There would be others, the legal, the insurance uh, fields, uh, government regular, all of those. Where's the easiest place to start that would impact the others that would most likely carry the idea forward if it was to go? Well, that, that's a great question, and I think um, <coughs> You know, before we did this work around the legal fictions idea, the talk stopped at kind of an awkward place because I realized in a very polarized society that we have right now, where we can, you know, debate the management of a patient like Terry Schiavo, that the stuff that I'm talking about here is way off the deep end of controversial. Um, and so I think that where we do need to stay, for at least the moment, is to respect the dead donor rule, at least in the breach. I mean, I, I think at least we need to have a way of saying that these organ donors are dead for legal purposes of organ transplantation, even if we acknowledge that in a medical sense they are not yet there. It's interesting that this is, this is, um, this is the approach that's been taken in Japan. Um, Japan does not see brain dead patients as dead in any sort of a medical or social or religious sense but they are willing to consider them as legally dead if the family wants the organs to be donated. Um, and, you know, complex cultural issues, why Japan came to that. But it's a, it is an example of a, of a culture where that metastable agreement has been successful. Yes, yeah, I, I think a major problem with regard to instituting this would be the natural fear that people would have that, well, they're just trying to get my organs, and so they're not doing everything, you know, the physicians are not doing everything that can possibly be done, and they're rushing to the decision to say, well, he's dead anyway, and so, you know, you might as well do the organ donation. And that's, that's the fear I have. Granted, if, if, you know, completely ethical practice were followed, it wouldn't be an issue, but in practice, I think that would be a great fear. Yes, and then, you know, um, the idea that, oh, they are, Rushing this in order to get the organs, I think, is really important and needs to be taken seriously. Um, I guess I would say that, to a large extent, though, we already have that problem in that 60 to 90 percent of patients who die in ICUs today do so after either physicians recommend that life support be withdrawn or the family comes to the physicians and say we want to talk about this and there's agreement to withdraw life support. And you know, there's already a lot of uh, distrust around why are you talking about withdrawing the ventilator now? Um, it seems too early for us. We want to go longer. And there's financial pressures now that are increasingly important in this decision. Um, all of that exists independent of this question of organ transplantation. And you know, um, uh, I, I think that that's actually the greatest area where we've got problems with trust right now. Families that are distrustful can always just say no to the organ transplantation piece anyway. We're still going to have to deal with them around how do we negotiate about when's the right time to withdraw life support. So I don't want to dismiss it, but I think it's, it's part of a bigger question that's already on top of us. And um, 
And this is only, this adds to it, but it's not the core problem. So uh, what is your definition of death? And then is that definition different in humans versus a mouse versus uh, an insect, for example? Oh, that's right. Oh. Lovely question, because um, I, didn't, I didn't develop that here, but in the book we do talk about a definition of death that crosses all species. It's where the body uh, no longer is able to maintain homeostasis, where all of the um, forces that are pushing towards disintegration, increasing entropy, those kinds of things, we are able to counteract those for the metabolic coordination of our bodies. And when you lose that, you're dead. And that, that's true whether you're uh, a human being, another animal, or a tree. Um, and that is, that is really what it means to be alive. We're a bacterium. And, uh, and so uh, that's what we would say was the definition of death. That typically follows uh, the heart stopping and uh, the organs uh, beginning to decay. So that's that's a clean definition, but it's a, the it's end, a, but there's a lot of ambiguity in what you what you just uh, present. Well, I'm just saying that um, certainly brain dead patients don't meet that definition because they live for years if you allow them. So they have not lost that ability to main, maintain homeostasis. And for the DCD ones, it's just that it's happening too soon. The back there, blue shirt. Yeah. Um, it's amazing how your presentation ties into what I think may have been the last one we had, where uh, a doctor showed us uh, a woman that was comatose, was actually working, meaning working on her brain, to close a gap caused by trauma so that she could talk, and kind of just totally blew us away. And I went up to him afterwards and I said, so uh, did you take philosophy? And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, so does Socrates, you know, affect you here? And he said, of course, meaning that the woman's self was not the brain, but saw something, felt something in the brain was getting, and she constructed a different pathway around the trauma. It was a stunning presentation. Um, and I think your comment that the loss of unity in the functions of the body is like a sure sign because the self is the most unified thing you could possibly imagine. And so I think you, you put that into your thinking. And this is obviously a religious concept in the sense that the self is immaterial. It's not the brain, as this woman's case showed. But, my, but I'm a philosopher, but I'm also a medical and this was the first presentation I gave to UC Davis was to the medical students on organ transplantation. Brought up that issue you mentioned. Would you bury this person now? Right. If they're dead, that's the next thing you do. Well, people were horrified. Right, right. Finally, now here's something I want, because I, people just don't think this through. Causing the time of death is not killing a person. Mm -hmm. So if you withdraw a respirator, you are undoubtedly causing the time of death. But it's what's wrong with the body that causes the person to die. And the notion of the underlying cause is critical in this issue. And I'm wondering what your response is to that. Yeah, so I want to resist that because... Um, <laughs> you see... Once you, once you bring in the word killing, um, I think it carries a lot of emotional, uh, moral baggage with it. I mean, it, it, it is so often used in a way that implies the action was wrong. And so I am, I'm trying to use a different terminology. I'm trying to say that when we withdraw a ventilator from a patient, we do cause that patient's death. Now, it's not in isolation. I said that whether causing the death is the right or the wrong thing to do depends, for example, on, you know, is this patient severely ill and no longer able to survive? Um, has the family agreed to it? So whether causing death is the right or the wrong thing to do depends on a lot of other things, but I, I think it's inescapable to say that we do cause death. Because if we didn't do it, they wouldn't die. They would stay on that ventilator for years. So. Um, I think it's kind of hard to get away from the causing death terminology. Yeah. So, 
let me get on the other side of the debate team and argue that we figured out how to make a machine to allow them to stay alive. So if the device that was created by human genius, human hands, human, human engineering feats didn't exist, then how can you say that we are to blame for their death by removing what we created if we hadn't created it? Okay, well, good point. Let me give you a counterexample. Um, suppose, uh, this is one that's been in the literature that I didn't just make this up on the moment, but uh, suppose there's somebody in the ICU on a ventilator and uh, his greedy nephew realizes that unless he dies before midnight, the greedy nephew is going to be cut out of the will. So the greedy nephew comes in, and this is somebody who has pneumonia, is, you know, young, is going to survive, just needs to stay on the ventilator a little bit longer. And the greedy nephew comes in and takes out the tube when the nurses aren't there and runs away and the patient dies. Um, what are you more inclined to say? The greedy nephew allowed the patient to die or the greedy nephew caused the patient's death? Well, um, if you're asking me that question, now you're getting into emotion, not logic. And emotion says he caused his death. No, logic says he caused his death. Emotion said, I mean, yeah. emotion in that sense says he caused his death too. Yeah. But they split when we have the doctor doing it around the, the dying patient. Exactly. And I'm saying if, if the greedy nephew caused the man's death when he took out the tube, same action, same action done by a physician, why aren't we willing to say that the physician caused the man's death? Well, be, first of all, I wouldn't say the physician caused the man's death, but this, the second reason is, is that one has a vested interest and one doesn't. One has a reason for doing it that's different than the right. reason that the other one has. One is ethical and one's not. One's right and one's wrong. But it's the other things that make them right or wrong, not the mere fact of whether it was causing death. In both cases, it's causing death. Sometimes causing death is ethical, sometimes it's not. When it's the greedy nephew causing the death in that story, it's unethical, it's wrong. When it's the physician causing death in a different setting, it's right. Both are causing death. It's the other factors that make them right or wrong. That would be the, I mean, that would be the argument. I mean, I, I recognize it's, it's, it's a hard swallow. So I have a different question. All right, there's other people here, but go, go ahead. ahead. No, okay. that's all right, go ahead. All right, let's go to the back, and we'll come back to you. Okay, in the very back, brother. What, would you say that the cause of death listed on death certificates then is a fiction in cases of removing life support? Oh, you know, that's a good question. I mean, um, you know, we usually do put down on the death certificate cardiac arrest as the cause of death. Right. The death certificate doesn't ask who caused the cardiac arrest. <laughs> Um, and so the death certificate doesn't really ask that. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't ascribe an agency to it. It just asks. Uh, so I, I don't know that the death certificate would actually differentiate. Cardiac arrest would be true no matter how you view the situation. Right. Uh, yeah. Over here in the back. Yeah. Thank you for a very thought-provoking talk. I, I wonder though if if there's no way to avoid. The idea that death is to some extent a socially defined construct, uh, that it's not really a medical state. And I go back to your example about the two athletes, the two young folks who died with a fairly similar uh, medical conditions, right? Right. And the one person died uh, on the basketball court uh, with no expectation of that death, with no advanced planning for that death. And so, Everybody, of course, would engage in a full resuscitative effort. And only after that had been fully exhausted would you feel comfortable saying that the person was dead. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you take the same patient, you give them a terminal illness, you put them in a hospital, you put some advanced planning around it, and now, a minute after the heart stops beating, everybody's around the bedside, yes, he's dead, I'm sorry, he's dead. It has nothing to do with organ transplantation. Mm -hmm. It's just that how we have defined the death is a function of the social circumstances of the cessation of cardiac function. Yeah, so okay. So we can't get around that whether we're dealing with organ transplantation or not. How we're defining death depends on the circumstances. So uh, a number of other people have made your point. I want to say it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Um, I don't agree with it. 
uh, in, in the following way. I think that um, when we declare death in a hospital, I mean, you know, typically, for example, uh, in, in the ICU, um, when I'm withdrawing life support from a child, if, if, if we have the monitors on, which we don't always do, but let's say we have the monitors on, I will declare the child dead at the time that the heart, the electrical activity stops. Now, in truth, I could resuscitate and probably get that heart going again, right? Um, in my mind, strictly speaking, that child isn't really dead at the time the electrical activity stops because the cardiac function is not irreversible at that time. I think it's just kind of a social convention that we do that. I think the real death, though, the true death, is some minutes after that, when, it, when the cardiac function truly has irreversibly stopped. So I would say your argument isn't, isn't a strong rebuttal to me because it's just kind of a social convention that we do with them. But the, the biology, I think, is the same in both cases. Yeah, no, I'm just pointing out the social convention. Yes, is called yes. The person dead. Yes, right. And, and but I would just say that's a social convention. I don't think that really speaks to when they are dead. But some people have used it to say that it should. So, I mean, uh, who hasn't had a chance to speak yet? Uh, but in the, yeah, Rich. Well, I would, I would challenge what you just said in terms of using the irreversibility of the organ as part of the definition of death. Because certainly we would all agree that somebody that's cold and pulseless and has been for many minutes is dead. Yet you can take various organs from that patient after those minutes, and they are, you know, they are usable and they have function that is not reversible. So to say that irreversibility is of the organ is part of the definition of death, I think I would have to challenge what you said. And I agree with what what uh, Dr. Romano said is that I have. I have a problem. I don't think it's realistic to um, expect that everybody is going to have the same definition and understanding of death. Because obviously, death to you, an ICU physician, means much something that's much different than the common person who has a completely different understanding of that. But I, I want to ask. There are a lot of other things that I take issue with. So, well, first of all, let's 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 remember that what I'm what I'm talking about is the act of removing the patient from the ventilator, whether that's unplugging the ventilator, removing the endotracheal tube, whatever it is, it's an act, and it is the proximal cause of that patient dying. If you did not do that, many of these patients would live for many many years. Um, what makes that ethical when you do that? Part of it is that the family has agreed with this decision. So I think that the... the, the I'm not the, arguing about the, whether it's ethical or not. I'm just arguing about the whole concept of... Well, did the family cause the death? No, the family was not the one who stopped the ventilator. The physician caused the death. That's one of the socially sanctioned roles we give to physicians. And what makes it okay or not are a lot of the things like whether the family agreed. And, you know, I mean, in terms of the family's participation in the decision, um, certainly I've... They do, right? We, we have these discussions. You know, do you want to keep going, in which case your loved one might live for a year or more, or do you want to stop now? And a lot of times we make that choice based on the family's decision. So I think that they do have an intimate role to play. Um, you know, I think that uh, I'll say more broadly, I mean, the evolution of intensive care in its modern way is in historical terms very recent. And I think that 
the also responsibilities and the decision making that go on there are still very uncomfortable for all of us. Um, and you know the, the idea. I mean, I, I truly understand the, the the sentiment of we can't play God. I mean, I understand where that's coming from. And yet, to think that in the intensive care unit every day we are not making decisions that have life and death implications for these patients is wrong. And yet, it's something that we are we are it's it's, it's relatively new for us uh, historically. And I think we are only beginning to come to terms with how to to deal with this in terms of, of our own ethical views. And that's, that is what I think is where the, the problem is with seeing us as causing death here. It's a responsibility that we don't want to feel that we have. And I'm pushing the envelope a little bit here by saying I think that we do have it whether we want it or not. I'm seeing Ben here. Ben, yeah, so, all right. I think that's a perfect place to stop. The clock tells us we have to stop. And so let's give Dr. Truth one more I meant to say it, but didn't. If, if, if you didn't notice from all those slide references, this is probably one of, if not the most prolific person in the world on this subject. And he and his colleague, Franklin Miller, have a book forthcoming from Oxford University Press later this year, Death, Dying, and Organ Transplantation, where he will tie, they will tie it all up in a nice, neat package. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for spending time with us, and we hope to see you at a future lecture. Good night. And the answer also in the title is no and not really. Here's what they said in this article, which I think is part of a, an important introduction to him. With regard to maintaining the trust of the public, to date the assumption has been that the public is not capable of engaging in a discussion about the ethical complexities of organ transplantation and needs to be reassured that the current practices accord with traditional ethical principles. Now, Dr. Trude's presence tonight is living proof and of affirmation that you are capable of engaging in the challenge of a full-fledged discussion in all of its ethical complexity. And the beauty of having that discussion orchestrated by Dr. Trude is that he is someone who brilliantly combines both the clinical and the ethical bona fides. So, without any further delay, please welcome to UC Davis, Dr. Robert Truman. Well, that may truly be the kindest introduction I've ever had, and I, uh, I do appreciate that. I got to know Ben Rich and Mark Yarborough out in, in Colorado many years ago, and it's wonderful to follow them both here to UC Davis, as you probably I uh, got the message, what I am going to talk about tonight is controversial, um, and uh, I'm going to keep my... Or you could go to CBS, and you could watch a program called Big Bang Theory. Now, my suspicion, but it's only a suspicion, is that this does not involve Professor Stephen Hawking, the astrophysicist, or perhaps a return from the hereafter by the late great Carl Sagan. What it does involve, I will, I will leave to your own inquiry because I'm someone whose viewing is limited to PBS public service programming. <coughs> I think you've chosen well by coming here tonight and let me tell you why. Uh, just a few academic preliminaries. We are, after all, an academic medical center. So, uh, Dr. True received his BS Summa cum laude, majoring in biochemistry at UCLA. He also received his MD from UCLA and was entered, uh, entered into Alpha Omega Alpha Honorary Fraternity. He did his pediatric internship and residency at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center, his anesthesiology residency back at UCLA, along with an anesthesiology and critical care fellowship. Along the way, 
He got a master's in philosophy at Brown University, being mentored by one of the preeminent figures in American bioethics, Dan Rock. Currently, he has professorial appointments at Harvard University in pediatric anesthesia, medical ethics, and he's also, as that indicates there, senior associate in critical care medicine at the Boston Children's Hospital. He's director of the Institute for Professionalism and Ethics at Harvard and jointly with Boston Children's Hospital. He has published over 200 articles in bioethics and professional journals. And, and I know that you've probably all taken kind of New Year's resolution pledge to ratchet down the volume of bioethics articles that you read. So if you read only one bioethics article this year, the one I commend to you was written by Bob and his colleague Dan Rock and another collaborator of his at the NIH, Franklin Miller, under the title of Moral Fictions and Medical Ethics, published in the journal called Simply Bioethics in 2010. If you can't find it and you want some help, send me an email and I will get you a copy of it. It will challenge your most basic assumptions, if not your core beliefs. And to his great credit, and one of the reasons I'm so glad he's here, is he does not shy away from what our friends across the Atlantic call controversy. And just to give you some further confirmation of that, he co-authored with his colleague Franklin Miller an article in a journal called Chest, which is the official journal of the American College of Chest Physicians with the provocative title that poses two questions. Are donors after circulatory death really dead? And does it matter? And comments as, as brief as I can to allow as much time for us to discuss them afterwards. And I welcome the, the opportunity to, uh, to debate this back and forth and, and do it in a way that uh, you know, hopefully we'll follow the uh, sort of standard set at the Republican debate the other night. I think we can, you know, do this in a in a way that uh, is much more um, both friendly but also exploratory and productive. So um, to move us along, um, I wanted to give a little bit of a background primer, if you will, for uh, how organ donation is done and the ethical standards that we use. So. Um, you need to know that there are two pathways for organ donation, the brain death pathway and the donation after cardiac death, or DCD pathway. And both of them begin with the question, is the patient dead? And this relates to kind of a, a fundamental ethical assumption that goes throughout the history of organ transplantation, that people must be declared dead before we remove a vital organ like their heart or their lungs or their liver. It's not actually a law anywhere, it's not written down anywhere, but it's this fundamental ethical assumption that has guided the ethics of organ transplantation. And so if you're on the brain death pathway over there, the patient is declared dead on the basis of the irreversible loss of all brain function, and then organs are removed um, while the heart is still beating or under a condition where the organs are in optimal condition. They're, they're getting oxygen and being perfused with blood right up until uh, the time that they're removed. Let me get the preliminaries out of the way before the introduction. Uh, my name is Ben Rich, and on behalf of the Bioethics Program with the UC Health System, I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of the fourth year of the Distinguished Bioethics Lecture Series at UC Davis. Those of you who do any flying at all are familiar with the refrain that you hear after touchdown, which is, we know you have a choice of airlines. Well, we know you have a choice of activities at this hour of the day. And your choice was particularly rich and diverse tonight. 
you could have joined the folks in our nation's capital as the President addresses a joint session in Congress. A place where it seems, uh, to quote Banquo in Macbeth, all seem to have eaten of the insane root that takes reason hostage. <laughs> <laughs> then you could perhaps go to NBC and you, if you haven't seen enough open hostility already, you could watch the kickoff of the opening game of the NFL season with the, I believe, the New Orleans Saints playing the Green Bay Packers. Or you could channel surf and you could go to ABC and watch a program called White Mouth, <laughs> which is actually not a documentary about our current economic circumstances, <laughs> nor about uh, the history of surfing in Southern California.